Welcome everyone to Fruits of the Orchard. Tonight is Parshat Ki Tisa. And in Fruits of the Orchard, there are four articles and we will be doing all four tonight. Obviously, we'll have to divide our time to get all four in. The first one is called Two Souls. Now there is a tradition that we get an extra level of soul on Shabbat. This is a, a well-known tradition. It's called the Neshama Yetera, an extra level of soul. The question is, how did the sages learn this? Where did they learn this from? So right before we say the Amida on Friday night, we say Vishamra B'nai Yisrael. And B'nai Yisrael, they shall guard the Shabbat. And it ends, it's a whole passage. We usually sing it. Vishamru B'nai Yisrael Evet Shabbat It's a very well-known tune, it's almost universal now, all over the world people sing that tune from Reb Shlomo for Vishamro. But it ends that, that in six days God created the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he, he ceased work and he rested. In Hebrew the word for he rested is by, by yina fash, which means in Hebrew today even, uh, Rest and relaxation is, is no fish, which is very close to chofesh, which is uh, vacation. But uh, no fish means to, to rest. But it's also the name of one of the levels of soul, nefesh, vayina fash. So it can be translated as God rested, or in a sense, and God became soul like. Now that's very hard to translate. But the, the sages made a, an incredible drusha on the word vayi nafash, and they divided by the syllables, and they said vai nefesh, oi to the nefesh, to the lowest level of soul. What are they talking about? So the, the tradition is, is that when Shabbat leaves, the extra level of soul leaves with the Shabbat. And that's one of the reasons that we have something uh, sweet smelling, a fragrance at Havdalah. It's said because when the soul leaves, like we feel let down. So we smell something uh, very fragrant to revive us, to give us life. So it's an amazing drasha that they learn, vai nefesh, vai nafash. But from this comes this idea that there's this level, extra level of soul. And the Balaturim points out that if anyone has the Balaturim and learns the Balaturim, so he had uh, traditions that go all the way back to the sages, is really one of the most important commentaries is the Balaturi. And there is, a, uh, there is a tradition that there are hundreds and hundreds of letters in the Torah that are written differently than you would expect. And the amazing thing is they don't appear in the Torah itself. There's just an oral tradition that this letter is written differently. So the Baal Turing points out, and he had this, this unbroken tradition of all of these letters. And he speaks about hundreds of them, actually, in his commentary. So he points out that in the word Vayina Fash, the pay is written differently than it's usually written. And it's called a double pay, like a, a two times pay. And the Balaturim says this is the tradition that says that there's a double level of soul 
on Shabbat. So then the question is, well, where does this soul come from? Is it something external? And as Shabbat starts, it, in a sense, um, like just kind of hovers and enters into each person? Or is it a higher level of soul that's contained within us all the time, but is only activated on Shabbat? So this is a question that is asked. In other words, is it internal or is it external? Most of the time, the answer to these questions from a Jewish perspective is both. There's a certain level where there's a certain spiritual holiness and ambience that comes in with Shabbat. And it is, in a sense, external because it's happening in time. The question is, do we plug into it or not? So obviously there are many people, it's Shabbat everywhere, but how many people actually plug in to the energy of Shabbat? So one answer is, is it's coming with the Shabbat. And the other answer, which is just as true, is there's something about Shabbat that awakens a level of soul that is usually not accessed. And they're both, both true. Either way, there is this idea of an extra soul on Shabbat. And for anyone who observes the Shabbat can testify that it's absolutely true because Shabbat is 1 60th of the world to come. It has the, the, the feeling of Gan Eden, of returning to the Garden of Eden. And so therefore, it's, it's very understandable of talking about an extra level of soul, an extra level of consciousness, of perception, of experience. Now, in the Shamru that we talked about, this passage that we sing before the Amida, there's two different places where a, an acronym is, is written out that spells the word Bia. Bia is one of the references to intimate marital relations. And so here from this, the, the sages learned that the most appropriate time for marital relations is on Shabbat, because here we're turning the, what seems to be a very physical act into a very spiritual, holy, mystical act. And so the two places where it comes is the words B'nai Yisrael, Oti. For, for the children of Israel, Shabbat is a sign. And the, those four words, B'nai Yisrael, Oti, spells out Bet, Yud, Aleph, He, Bia. And the second time is B'nai Yisrael et Shabbat. The children of Israel, in a sense, it is one with the Shabbat. So this goes along with a tradition. There's a Midrash that says that after God created the world, so he paired days together. The first day became, as it, as it were, a soulmate, a pair with the second day. The third and fourth days, and the fifth and the sixth day. And so Shabbat came and said, well, who is, who is my pair? Who am I paired with? And God said, your pair is the children of Israel. That's who your soulmate is. So this is a very, very beautiful idea that... We are soulmates with Shabbat. Am Yisrael is soulmates with Shabbat. And in that reference, Shabbat is the bride and we are the groom. Whereas usually in relationship to Hashem, Hashem is the groom and we are the bride. So here we have this term that we've used many times called Interinclusion, hit kalalut, 
where sometimes we are the groom in relationship to the bride, Shabbat, and also Eretz Yisrael, by the way. And sometimes we are the bride of, of God. So that is the first article. Obviously, we could go much deeper. I'll leave it to everyone to meditate on what we just learned. I think I've mentioned this before, that many times, scores and scores and scores of times, Rav Ginsburg would finish like a two, three, sometimes longer hour class. And at the end, he would say, now everyone should meditate on what we just learned, <laughs> which I used to do uh, religiously. <laughs> I still do. Okay, the next article is called Lack of Patience. So this is connected to this Parsha. The first half of this Parsha, Kitisa, continues learning about the Mishkan, about the tabernacle. And then the second half is, is completely wrapped up in what's called the sin of the golden calf, the Egel Zahav, the golden calf. So how did the whole episode with the golden calf happen? When Moshe went up to the mountain, he told them, I'll return in 40 days. But it was somewhat ambiguous when the, when the, 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 the stopwatch began. So after 40 days, the Torah says the, the people saw that, that Moshe was late. And the word for late here is boshesh. It's not a, a common word for late, but here it's boshesh. And there's a vav. It's written without a vav. It could be written with a vav. And vav equals six. Now, if you hear the word itself, bo shesh, shesh means six. So the oral tradition is after six hours from the time that the people thought that Moshe should be back, it's just that they were counting the time differently. It was just a misunderstanding. But after six hours, the people panicked. And they came to Arwood and said, Moshe is not coming back. Make us gods to lead us. And this led to the making of the golden calf. There's many, many things to learn about making of the golden calf. We can only pick one of the elements here. And one of the Midrashim say that the Satan came and he created an image in the clouds as if it was Moshe's uh, being buried. They looked at the clouds and they imagined, or the, 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 the Satan tricked them through a uh, fantasy imagination that they were witnessing the death of Moshe. And so that's connected to this whole thing that, that they panicked. Like Moshe is not coming back. Who's going to lead us? Rav Ginsburg points out a, a beautiful gematria that in Hebrew, the word for imagination is koach hamidameh, the power of imagination. Now, the power of imagination can be something extremely negative. And at the same time, it can be incredibly uh, positive. And in fact, the, the, the two commentaries, commentaries who speak the most about the reality of prophecy is the Rambam, Maimonides, and the Ramchal. And both of them say the same thing, that prophecy is connected deeply to the imagination. But this is when the imagination is clarified and it becomes a vessel 
for divine uh, experience, for prophecy, for inspiration. So Rav Ginsburg says that the gematria of this uh, word is 122, which equals exactly ego hazahav. So I just saw the chat, and, and yes, I think I mentioned it. And the word boshesh is the word shesh, six. That's why they um, thought he was he was late. So here we see that the egel of zahav, the golden calf, is a false type of imagination. The people imagined that uh, forms of gold could lead them. And actually, the commentaries point out that in a sense, they made the golden calf in order to use that as, as a, a means or a vehicle for licentiousness, for uh, sexuality. So, Again, the, the, the imagination was running wild. Now, according to tradition, the leaders of those making the golden calf was what's called the Erev Rav, the mixed multitude that came out of Egypt with B'nai Yisrael. I'm gonna come back to that in a few minutes because it's uh, significant. So just for background, there, there were many people that Yosef, when, when, when there was a famine, so the people came to Pharaoh and said, give us food. And Pharaoh says, go to Yosef and whatever he says you should do. And so Rashi explains, and the commentaries explain, what does that mean? Yosef said, you want food? Circumcise yourself. Yosef, again, we're going to come back to this, had a vision, and it says a messianic vision, that he could fix Egypt. And especially in the, in the realm of sexuality. So those who, who actually circumcised themselves became what's called the mixed multitude. And when we left Egypt, they asked Moshe to come along. And Moshe also had this messianic vision that we could turn on the whole world. The problem is, is God said, don't take them. They're not ready. They're not ready yet. They need more time until their souls mature. And Moshe did not listen, and he took them. And we're told that this, the heir of Ra were, were the instigators of making the golden calf. Some of Israel followed them, but the instigators were the heir of Rav. So this is a Torah that's brought down like all over the place, that the, the, the source of the problem here was a lack of patience. The people, like six hours, I mean, only 40 days before they received the Torah at Sinai and the greatest revelation in all history. And 40 days later, they're ready to exchange God for a golden calf. So it's explained that this is the, the result, and we can all learn from this on a very personal level of what can happen with a lack of patience. <clears throat> As the saying goes, it's all in the timing. You could, a person can have the right uh, intent and, and want to do the right thing, but they just can't wait. They just they jump the gun. So we're told that this is not the only sin caused by a lack of patience. But it's very briefly, we're told that uh, according to tradition, if Adam and Eve would have waited until Shabbat, then they would have been able to not only eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but also the tree of life. But they didn't have patience. 
and they went ahead and ate it. Of course, this is a whole story. <clears throat> I just mentioned this idea of lack of patience. And then we have one more instance of this, a very significant one is David goes up to the roof and he sees a beautiful woman bathing there. And it wasn't just that he was overtaken by sexual desire. He saw, rightfully so, that this was his soulmate. And in fact, in the Gomorrah, they say that they were soulmates from the six days of creation. That David and Bathsheba were meant to be together. But it was problematic the way that David went about it. And again, we just simply don't have the time to go into depths about this. But he, he didn't wait and he had relations with her before it was appropriate to have relations. So here we see three cardinal sins. Now there's a very deep connection between the sin of David and Bathsheba and the sin of the golden calf. Because in both instances, the Gomorrah uh, ponders this and says, David, it just, it, 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 it wasn't in him to do this. And that whole generation, they were called the generation of, of knowledge. Like, how did it happen that they, they went along to make a golden calf? And in both instances, the Gomorrah answers, in the, in the case of the golden calf, in order to show tshuva or repentance for the multitude, because they did. Afterwards, Moshe comes down, he breaks the tablets, and all of Israel does tshuva. And we got a second pair of, uh, of uh, luchot, of tablets, and God forgave us. And they did tshuva. And the same thing with David. David, when, they, when the prophet, uh, in, in a parable form, kind of revealed to him how wrong he was, David said immediately, Khatati, I have sinned. And the entire rest of his life, he, did, he was in a constant state of tshuva for this one act with Bathsheba. In the end, he did marry her. And from her comes King Solomon, who built the temple. But in both cases, there is this divine providence happening like the story of Purim, like behind the scenes, God is not taking away our free will. David had free will and he, and he had to pay for it. And the people also exercise their free will. But here is the great mystery and paradox that the, the sages were alluding to the fact that, that it was in a sense, meant to be, which doesn't take away people's responsibility, but God, in a sense, turned it into an opportunity to reveal tshuva in the world. So now I wanna go back. So here we have three different instances of lack of patience. There's one more cardinal sin in the, in the Chumash, in the five books of Moses, and that's the, the spies. And here it's the opposite. The spies go for 40 days, they come back, and they say it's an incredibly beautiful land, but we cannot conquer this land. And, and the people, again, panicked and said, let's choose new leaders and let's go back to Egypt. And this was considered such an uh, horrendous sin, they ended up having to wander for 40 years in the desert till that generation passed away. So here, it's almost the opposite. If they would have had patience and listened to Yoshua and Kalev, and they would have had patience and, and tried to go into the land, it would have turned out differently. But they 
also lacked patience and uh, the results were 40 years of wandering in the desert. So here we have a, a, a typical situation where each and every one of us faces all the time, like choices at crossroads. It could be like life changing ch choices that we have to make or very, you know, 100 choices a day. But the idea is sometimes we can uh, exert our will to be patient and wait. And in fact, the word chachma, wisdom, if you permute the letters differently, spells out michake, to wait. That one of the greatest wisdoms is to wait. Sometimes, uh, this is so typical in our day, we get an email and it ticks us off. And we immediately like write back this, uh, you know, rebuttal to this email, like and send it in, in, two, in two minutes. We, we don't even have the, the, the patience just to like, think about what would be the best way to deal with this situation. And we find ourselves in that all the time. On the other hand, sometimes opportunities appear and we drag our feet. We're afraid, we're suspicious, we don't have the confidence and this incre incredible opportunity goes right to our fingers. So how do you know, how do you know which one it is? So I just want to go back to Yosef. So Yosef did both, and we could see this. When Pharaoh has dreams, and no one can interpret them for him, so the butler tells him about this uh, dream interpreter in jail, and they bring Yosef. And he interprets Pharaoh's dream. Now, remember, he was just in jail for 12 years. And here he's standing before the, the, the king of, e of Egypt. And he interprets the dream. So you would think, okay, he's done interpreting the dream. That's what Pharaoh asked. It's time to be quiet. What does Yosef do? He, he launches into this whole advice of what Pharaoh should do. He's telling Pharaoh what to do. And, but we could see that, that Yosef saw the door of opportunity is wide open here. Why should I be patient here? Now is the time to go through. So that we see one way of dealing with opportunity. And the other we mentioned already, that Yosef saw in the famine, maybe this is an opportunity to, in a sense, spiritually take over Egypt, change the world radically, a revolution. And so he wanted to circumcise all the Egyptians as a first step towards uh, a, a spiritual revolution. Well, there he's jumped the gun. He jumped the gun. And the same thing with Moshe. Moshe, God even told him, don't take them. He wasn't being mean. He was just said, they're not ready yet. But Moshe was like, wow, we're coming out of Egypt. Freedom is in the air. Like, let's change the world. Let's, let's, let's just do it. So again, he, in a sense, lacked the patience of waiting for these souls to mature. So it's the same with us. We have, like I said, small choices we have to make and big choices. And sometimes being patient is the wise thing to do. And other times, like the, the way Reb Shlomo used to say, if, if, you, if the door is open a crack, push it open the whole way. 
or as the, the, the Rebbe um, from, from Chabad said, uh, um, people say if there's a wall in front of you, um, first try to go under it. And if you can't go under it, then try to go over it. And he said, Lachatchila Reber. No, I say, jump over it immediately. Don't try to figure a way to go under it. Just jump over it. So some, sometimes this is the right way to go, and sometimes that is the right way to go. I bless all of us to, to know the difference, to know when to jump and when to hold back. The next article is called Only You. And this comes from when Moshe comes down from the mountain, he sees him worshiping the golden calf, he breaks the tablets, and then he begins a 40 day, a second 40 day period of, of trying to elicit God's forgiveness. But in that, uh, for those who have Fruits of the Orchard, it's on page 233. So this is what God said to Moshe. He said, go ascend from here. Now, this is after God, in a sense, has, has agreed to forgive them. But God says, go ascend from here, you and the people you have brought up from the land of Egypt to the land I swore to Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you to, to, um, to drive out the Canaanites. And then later, and, and this passage ends with God saying, because I will not go up in your midst since you are a stiff-necked stiff -neck people lest I destroy you on the way. So God says, I, I'll take you to Eretz Yisrael, but it's not going to be with my direct presence. I'm going to send an angel because right now you're, you're a stiff-necked people and uh, it, it's, it's, it's not a healthy situation for me to be too close to you right now. So Moshe responds to this. And Moshe says, if your presence does not go with us, do not take us up from here. In other words, Moshe says, no way. Either you're coming with us or we're not moving. <laughs> we're not, we, we won't go. You have to come with us. And he gives a reason because he, he, he says, that um, <clears throat> he says, for, for how then will it be known that I have found favor in your eyes, I and your people? And later, he, he, he is part of this whole 40 day dialogue that's going on. He says to, to God, what, what is the world going to say? You are strong enough to bring us out of Egypt, out of slavery, and then you just. You let us die in the desert. It's not a very good promotion for <laughs> belief in one God. It's like not good public relations. But that's exactly what Moshe says. It's in the Torah. He didn't use those words, but it's exactly what he was saying. What will people say? That you couldn't deliver. So, but here the point is that Moshe is saying, you have to come with us. It's, it, it's, it's not good enough for us to, for you to send an angel. So this is connected to a very, very well-known uh, phrase from the Alter Rebbe, that the Alter Rebbe once said, Master of the world, I don't want your, your merit. I don't want your world to come. I don't want your gun, Aiden. I want you. I want you. That's all I want. I want to be close to you. I want to be one with you. 
And so this is a, a well-known statement. But here we could see that Moshe, in essence, was saying the same thing. And we could see this in the Haggadah. So it's on page 235, where it, it's very, very similar that the 10th plague, the killing of the firstborn, which led to finally Pharaoh letting the people go. So in the Haggadah, it says like this. It's, it's quoting verses from the Torah with the explanation of the sages. I will go through Egypt. That's written in the Torah. And the sages say, I am not an angel. Again, from the Torah. And I will slay, slay every newborn. The sages explain, I am not a, a burning angel. I will execute judgments against all the gods of Egypt. Again, that's written in the Torah. And again, the sages say, I am not an angel. It says in the Torah, I am God. And the sages say, I am no other. In other words, the, the final plague had the presence of God. Even though we talk about, in a sense, there was a, a, an angel, an agent, the destroyer. But here, the, the sages are saying it, it was really God. It's very similar to the, to the burning bush. That at first, if, if we pay attention, it says that it was an angel of God who appeared to him. But then the whole rest of the incident only mentions God himself. So here we have this concept that sometimes an agent is like the one who sends them. And in fact, in a certain way, this is the power of Chabad. The power of Chabad is that every shaliach has the power of the Rebbe with them. So I want to take this just a little bit farther, is that the the nature of the of, of a Jewish soul. The Jewish soul has a burning desire to be one with God. The Slonim Rebbe says like this, is that all of the mitzvot of the Torah have one purpose. And he says that purpose is what's called to, to cling to God to not just come close, to literally cling, to become one with God. And so this idea explains very, very well, oh, it's still happening. I'm not sure as much as over the last 30, 40 years, but in a sense it's happened through all of history. When when, when a Jewish soul does not find its place in Torah, it will look in other places for that spirituality. And we know very, very well in the 60s, the 70s, 80s, but even, even still today, still today, so many cults or other religions or other philosophies or other spiritual paths have a very high percentage of Jews involved in them. This is a, 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 known, a known thing. And this is really, even though in his lifetime, he got a lot of flack for it. Afterwards, there's a general consensus that now people understand, but Reb Shlomo used to go to all of these holy man jamborees, all of these uh, ecumenical um, conferences. He went to India. 
he would go to Hare Krishna, he would go to the Munis, he would, he, any, it's meditation centers, whatever it is, because he knew, he knew that a high percentage of them were Jewish and they were just, they couldn't find it in, in, in I wouldn't even say Torah, it's just they weren't raised that way. They couldn't, they had no entry into Judaism. But he would go looking for sparks. And it, it's, it's, it's a known thing that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people were brought back to Yiddishkeit, to Torah, by Reb Shlomo from these places. I, I, I personally saw with my own eyes how he was able to do this. So this is this idea that the altar Rebbe is saying, I want you. Moshe is saying, no, I we won't accept an angel. We want you. This is such a deep, deep understanding. And David Melech, in the psalm that we say from Rosh Chodesh Elo through, depending on the custom, Hoshana Rabbah or Simchas Torah, <clears throat> so he's in the 27th Psalm. He says, Achat sha'alti me'et Hashem, ba'ota avakesh, shifti be'beit Hashem kol yamei chayai. So David says, God, I have only one request from you. Let me sit in your house. Now, remember, there wasn't a temple at that point. He's not talking about a physical place. He's saying, let me sit in your presence, call you mechayai, all the days of my life. That was his one request. Let me be close to you. Let me be one with you. And David said, Vani tefillah, I am prayer. Meaning, doesn't say, I pray. David said, Vani to feel I am prayer. His, his request, his desire was to be in a constant state of prayerfulness in connection with, with God. And the Rambam actually brings down, talking about the mitzvah to love God, says a person should love God until they're love sick. So they're love sick. And actually, um, there's, there's, there's many, many uh, Zmirot that mention this concept of being love sick when we don't feel that closeness. Of course, we want always to feel that closeness, but when we don't, we actually, in a sense, feel sick from the, the, the distance between us and God. Okay, now the last article from Kitisa is called Tablets of the Heart. So when God gave the two tablets to Moshe, so the Torah says it, it, the words charut aleluchot, that the, the words of the Ten Commandments were engraved in the tablets. Now this is talking about the first tablets, which we're told was, was written, however we understand this, the etzba elokim, with the finger of God, however we understand that. But what we want to discuss now is what does it mean engraved on the tablets? Okay, we have the simple understanding that we had words engraved on the tablets. The sages in a brilliant drush say, don't read it Charut ala luchot, read it cherut ala luchot. Don't read it engraved on the tablets, read it freedom on the tablets. The message is clear that the, the, the way to freedom is by observing the Torah. Now, this is a very important point because we could say, well, we, we went out of Egypt. 
We went from being slaves to free people. We're free now. But the whole secret of counting Sphira to Omer, which is connecting Pesach to Shavuos, Pesach to when the Torah was given, is telling us that that freedom, if it's not connected to the Torah, is not a definition, not a Jewish definition of freedom. And it will probably lead you off the cliff. In other words, freedom without purpose in, in a lot of cases is a disaster. So a lot of times we think being free means, and in, in, in much of the world, freedom means I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, with whomever I want, and no one can tell me different. That's what freedom is. I make all my choices. No one tells me what to do. And in, in, in great measure, the more money I can make, the more freedom I'll have to do whatever I want to do, when I want to do, how I want to do. That is, in the world, that is really the definition of freedom. That's, uh, many of us grew up like that. It's just, we want to get to a place in life that no one can tell me anything. I can, I can. So here we have this great paradox. The Torah tells us from the, from the morning, moment we open our eyes to the moment we go to sleep, tells us how we're supposed to live. Minute by minute, a hundred blessings a day. A hundred blessings a day. So for the world, looking from the outside, they would ask, this is freedom? Like, are you crazy? <laughs> are you out of your mind? You're going to let a book determine what you do? But we know differently. And the, the reason is very simple, that without the Torah, most people are ruled by their lower nature, what's called the animal soul. And therefore, you have a lot of people, a lot of very rich people, a lot of very powerful people, a lot of very accomplished people, a lot of very good people, good people, good people. But when it gets down to it, they're ruled by their animal nature. Now you can open the, the, the paper every single day and read scandal after scandal after scandal after scandal in, in countries everywhere in the world where people let sex and money and power ruin them. They, they, they are ruled. They think they, that they're free. But like I said, I don't think a day goes by in any country in the world where there's not some scandal of someone trying to, you know, get away with something because they're driven by their lower nature. That's the freedom that Torah allows us. It allows us to become a master as much as possible, because we're human beings, over our lower nature and make decisions from a higher level of consciousness. So I want to just quote two uh, very, very popular uh, singers with two very different ideas of freedom. The first one goes back to the 60s. Again, I'm not even sure what people know anymore. <laughs> it kind of ages me. But I'm sure everyone's heard of, at least heard of Janis Joplin. And so in one of her songs, Me and Bobby McGee, she says, freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. Nothing, it ain't nothing if it ain't free. But let's concentrate on the first thing. And what she was, she was talking about is 
a lot of people's attitude. Freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. And if people get in so much trouble because of that, and Janice Joplin lived by her creed and died by her creed. She died at 27 from a, an overdose. And she, she probably believed she had, she had nothing to lose. <laughs> it's just my life. And the other quote is actually a, a, a much more uh, Torah philosophy. And this is from Bob Dylan. And it's in a song, an, an amazing song called Joker Man. Anyone could you know, find it on Google, Joker Man. And one of the verses is, um, freedom is just, around the, is just around the corner for you. But with truth so far off, what good would it do? I'm going to say that again. Freedom is just around the corner for you. But with truth so far off, what good would it do? So here, Bob Dylan is really saying very similar to, to what the Torah say. Freedom without a purpose, without truth, without morals and ethics and, and godliness is what good would it do? You think you're free. But truth is so far off, what good is this freedom going to do you? So like I said, that is the, the, the deep connection between Pesach and Shavuos. And so we count the days between to tie them together so that we know that coming out of Egypt, coming out of slavery, is not just physically leaving a, a place or even in, in consciousness stop being a slave, then you have to have the second part of the equation is to have the means and the ability and the advice. Actually, in, in, in the Zohar, they call the 613 mitzvot, 613 pieces of advice. Because each one is, is advice how to rule over our lower nature and become free to really express ourselves, to really fulfill ourselves, and to accomplish what we want to. So those are our four articles for the Parsha. We have to end with something about Purim. Purim is tomorrow night. Purim is coming. And for those who are at, here at the beginning, so we, we played the song, um, Kael Mistater, you are a hidden God. And that's really the main message of Purim is we're told that God is hidden for two reasons. One reason is if God was totally revealed, we would have no free choice. If it was just so clear to us that what to do, we wouldn't have free choice. So some people might say, well, what's so bad about that? God, just reveal yourself. What do I need free choice for? But this is like a parent with children, is we, we direct our children, we give birth to our children, we have hopes for our children. But our main task is to educate them to stand on their own. And God is our Father in heaven. And the greatest gift that he could give us is, is the, the tools for us to stand on our own. And sometimes it's very painful to have to make these choices to get it wrong and everything that goes along with it. But ultimately, the same thing with, with a parent. 
is we, we try to shield our children as much as we can, but there's a certain place where it just, you're on, you're on your own. You, you, that's how it's supposed to be. And, and, and we bless you. And the second reason is very simply that if, at, like at Mount Sinai, when God truly reveals himself, so our souls left our bodies. It was just too much. It's just, I mean, I mean we have no, no concept of the power of God. It's just, I mean, I mean, now because of science, it's just, I mean, we could say the words, but to actually understand what it means that there are 10 billion galaxies and that each galaxy has 10 billion stars. We could say the words, but <laughs> do we have any concept what that means? And on top of that, the entire universe is expanding at phenomenal speeds. <laughs> it's like getting bigger and bigger and bigger every second. We have no concept. So if God would fully reveal himself, there would be no world. There would be no world. Everything would be turned to iron. So one of the teachings of, of Purim is Achen. Therefore, you are a hidden God, the God of Israel who saves. So God saves us all the time, but we don't always see it. God is very, very hidden. And Purim is the idea of being aware of it, acknowledging it, being joyous with it. And one last thing is about drinking on Purim. <clears throat> I'll keep it short. For those who have um, Seasons of the Soul, uh, actually today, uh, everyone in email and WhatsApp got our Purim edition. There's like a score of articles, audio, uh, video music, the whole thing. But in there, I discuss at length the whole idea of, of getting to what's called ad de lo yada. Until we don't know the difference between Borach Mordechai and Ar Haman. And just in short, I'm sure I hope everyone will go to these Purim editions and um, will take advantage. But a lot of people think just like freedom. A lot of people think that the idea of drinking on Purim is to get so drunk that we don't know the difference between anything. We just pass out from drunkenness. That is not the point. It's definitely not the point. In fact, the sages meant something altogether different. Yes, they encouraged that sometimes, you know, a little chayim can help uh, loosen us up a little bit, help us be a little bit happy. If it doesn't do that, then there's no point to drinking on Purim. The idea is, is if a, a, a lachaim or a, a cup of wine can help us be a little bit more joyous than we usually are, oh, great. But the idea is, is to get to a very, very high level of consciousness and actually I, I'm gonna I'm gonna paraphrase it. Rob Ginsburg just came out with just a short statement and he said like this he said in order you know what hold on one second I'm trying to think where it is I want to read it hold on
Sorry for the delay because I really want to read this in the Hebrew. He writes like this. Adeloyada, getting to the place where we don't know. Beli machshava hu holalut. Without thought is foolishness. Bishvil ha'adeloyada, in order to fulfill getting to the place that we don't know. Sarich data kol. First, we have to know everything. You can't get to a place of not knowing unless you know everything. Lil od chasidut. A person has to learn chasidus. But az ad lo yada shalcha shave mashu. Then, when you get to a place that you don't know, is worth something. What is Rav Ginsburg trying to say here? He's trying to say the ad lo yada means just simply the acknowledgement that no matter how much I know, I acknowledge that I don't know everything. I can't know everything. God is much greater than anything I could possibly know. But we're going to read this a little bit differently. Adelo yada. We could read it. Adlo, comma, yada. Until the voice inside of you that says no, negative, I can't, I won't, I'm not able. Until that voice gets to the level of knowing. So in other words, just like in meditation, in prayer, where sometimes we get, we, we, we do what we're thinking, and then we just get to beyond thought, beyond logic, beyond, really beyond thought. We're just, um, what's, what we talked before about the vekut, of clinging to God, just the experience. It's like a prophetic experience. That's Adelo Yada. But it depends on knowing everything, <laughs> in a sense. So it's very paradoxical. But all I'm trying to say is, I want to wish everyone with a very joyous Purim. And whatever drinking that we do should be in from a very high place. And we're not trying to blank out. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to get to this moment of absolute clarity, but it's beyond thought. It's, it's adlo yada. To know means thought, but to get there, like Ralph Ginsburg says, in a sense, you have to know everything. And I'll end by saying in the Shema, there's two large letters. The ayin of Shema and the Dalad of Echad. So ayin and Dalad spells out aid, witness, teaching us that Israel is the witness to the world of God's oneness. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Hero Israel, God our God, God is one. But if you take those big letters and you reverse them, so it's Dalad Ayan, which is Da, to know. So here, the message is that our faith in the oneness of God is based on everything that we know to be true. Faith is based on knowledge, on, on truth. It's not blind faith. It's based, it's, it's, our faith is so strong because we know the oneness of God is true. So I want to bless everyone to get to that place on Purim. And it should be a safe Purim for everyone. And it should be full of joy.